Oh my god, I'm so tired of this. I'm tired of like the ups and downs. Episode number 10 of the Mets Sub Podcast here. You're listening to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, watching us. We're back on YouTube. We missed you last time, but we're back here. It figures because, of course, last episode was a happy one. It was a good one. This one, we're a little bit back to down in the dumps. The Mets just finished up a two-game series against the Boston Red Sox, and it just simply wasn't pretty. It was not good. It was super, super bad. And there's not a lot of positive things to talk about here besides what you probably already know, but we're going to go into it because you know us. We love to dissect every single game possible. Before we do get going into it, make sure you drop us a follow on all our social media, Mets Up, Instagram, and Twitter. And same thing with the YouTube channel. If you want to watch the podcast, because we do upload videos there, you got Jeter had no range. James Shiano, my co-host here alongside me, Giraffe Neck Mark talking about Mets baseball, and I mean, let's just say it, uh, we suck really, really bad right yeah, now. Yeah, the Mets the Mets might stink. The, we might have thought that some of the players in this team were better than they are. After getting swept and allowing three runs in two days, I am so down right now. I feel defeated, beleaguered. I'm so happy there's an off day tomorrow. I'm it's thrilled. Great. Yeah. It's, I'm getting a little travel day, too, because I'm headed to Texas with the Boston Red Sox. So it's like I don't even have to worry about Mets baseball tomorrow. And that's the last thing I want to think about because, my God, is it's the offense. The offense is so, so bad. The offense is awful. We scored one run in 21 innings. And luckily, luckily we found a win in that mix. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> And, oh, God, like, this this series, the Red Sox didn't particularly even do anything well. Like, I, I know you're going to say, like, they pitched pretty well. I'm, I'm they pretty did pitch sure pretty well. That. But, like, also, I think the Mets' horrendous at-bats helped them seem like they pitched a little bit better than they did. Because watching Garrett Richards and Nick Pavetta in the last two days, never did I go, oh, my God, these guys are untouchable, and the Mets made them look that way. No, yeah, of course not. But, again, I said this heading into the series. It was a fear of mine that... These Red Sox pitchers are better than everyone thought. I said that preseason on Twitter, whatever, but it just seems that this is true now. The Red Sox came out here with Garrett Richards and Nick Pavetta and diced us up two days in a row. And on top of those two, the bullpen, their bullpen looked pretty damn good. The bullpen looked good, and this almost even builds into the Mets here. Like, everyone was worried about the Red Sox pitching, right? Everybody was worried about the Mets pitching, and that is by far been the saving grace of the season is that the pitching is the reason why we're even close to having a 500 record right now. And it's because you get DeGrom every five days, who's just unbelievable. And we'll get going into him as well. But even Peterson gave one, gave us a good start. The bullpen's been great. Everything that we thought was going to be a problem besides the defense, defense hasn't been great. Yeah. But defense. Pitching, we, we knew defense wasn't good. Remember, you remember spring training when we were hitting the shit out of everything? I do. That I, was fun. I was excited. Yeah. Spring training was a lot of fun. I wish we were still in spring training because this sucks. This st- like this stinks. I when this team sucks, they suck. And right now, they suck. This stretch has caused me to get a little bit introspective on some of the Mets key pieces, which I don't want to do because no, it's, we it's like to stay games. positive. 20 games in, these guys have relatively proven track records, but maybe there's a chance that Dom Smith isn't like a surefire middle of the order bat that we thought he was last year after a nice sample. Maybe he's just still a depth piece and it's offensive liability. McNeil, he's had these bouts each of the last three years now where he's looked just lost for periods at a time. Maybe if that slump extends a little further than it has in the past, he just he just loses his touch. Maybe, I don't know, Pete, everything Pete was doing so well for the last couple of weeks, he completely, it completely went out the window in two games. What the, what the fuck happened to Pete? He, he was spitting on sliders for weeks consecutively, and he just swung it everything these last two days he looked terrific at the plate i think up until like that last out at the at the end of the game for him he struck out six times in a row and we were talking about in the national series how good he was and how he wasn't striking out and he was finally starting to look like he was patient pete and we said we love patient pete patient pete we did not see patient (laughs) pete this series so (laughs) patient pete sounds like a a character in like a child's television show who goes to the doctor (laughs) patient pete here's patient pete patient pete has a knee scrape (laughs) This is what Patient Pete does. And right now, we're just, I mean, I would love to see Patient Pete at the plate again. I miss Patient Pete. He's gone. He's nowhere to be seen. This team tends to avalanche or snowball. Snowball is the right word. Avalanche isn't the right thing, but it feels like an avalanche. (laughs) It feels like an avalanche. Everything's just falling down on top of us. Can't get out. Everything's falling down. And like when we're playing bad, we play bad. Besides the Grom and the bullpen again, I mean that's a lot. That's a big part of the game. But really, offensively, nobody picked nobody picked anyone up. There's not there's there's not one person who 
look competent these last two days at the plate. There was no hitter where I came up that I was like, oh, I feel kind of good. Even Conforto apparently was on a five-game hitting streak. Gary said during that last inning, I, I had no idea. You, you could you could have fooled me. It was the measliest five-game hitting streak of all time. The dude was scraping it by. His at-bats still look horrendous. I don't care what the five-game hitting streak says. He looks horrible at the play. He looks lost. Even that base hit from Pete, I think it was in the eighth inning. That was the laziest ground ball I've ever seen in my life. It just happened to find a hole just based on the Red Sox alignment. It was, I, there, I, I don't even know how many balls we hit hard tonight. It couldn't be more than a few. So the Mets in this entire game only put one ball in play at 100 miles an hour or more, and it was exactly 100 miles an hour, and that was McNeil's base hit, which really was just misplayed by Verdugo because the ball hit right at you was the hardest play oh, to no, make. Kike, Kike was in Kike, center. Kike, Kike was in center, and, right? And yeah, it looked Verdugo's like he slipped corner. or just got, like, stuck in the mud, which that can happen sometimes. And then otherwise, we only had four other balls in play that were at hit the hard hit rate, uh, what's the word, threshold, 95 miles an hour. McCann's double play which sucked. <laughs> Lindor's line out, which that was just a sick play by uh, Marwin. Conforto, a fly out, I don't even remember this. And Alonzo had the ground out. That was hard. I was getting so crazy after the game that I was going on fan graphs and looking at team batting stats and just going through any single thing that I can try and find as to what the reason is that the Mets can't hit. And it just simply comes down to extra base hits. We are not getting a single extra base hit at all. We're not even hitting poorly. Like average wise, we're getting on base. I think on like a top 10 in the league. Our OPS is like top 12, top 13, which is a team that should be able to score everything except runners in scoring position and extra base hits. The Mets are doing fine. It's just those two things. Dude, definitely. I honestly did the exact same thing after the game to try and get some fun stats for the listeners at home, even though this isn't fun. But the Mets have the 12th highest swinging strike or so whiff percentage in the league, which is not high. It's middle of the pack. And they have the fifth lowest K rate in the league. So the ball is being put in play. And when I dug into it deeper, the Mets are the unluckiest team so far in baseball in terms of weighted OBA was on base average minus your expected weight of WOBA, which is that's a stat cast analytics trying to be analytical, but they have the largest difference between their actual outcomes and their expected outcomes this year. Is that an excuse? Absolutely not. Does that mean anything? Doesn't feel like it right now, but it still just means that there is going to be, we're going to find level at some point. These guys aren't bad. We're just, we're, if the Mets were striking out at a league high clip, I would be much more nervous than with this, but they're not. They're not doing that. They're striking out one of the lowest rates in the league. The ball's being put in play. Eventually, it's going to drop, right? We've been saying it for three weeks. Eventually, it's going to drop. It has to at some point. And I've even put like talked about, like, like I don't want to fire Chili Davis because I think Chili Davis is a good hitting coach, and I don't think it's his fault because even when you go to this ground ball percentage, they're not towards the top of the league. They're hitting a league average amount of ground balls, which you would think that the Mets are pounding the ball into the ground if you watch a game, but that's not the case. They're hitting line drives almost towards the top of the league. So that's another thing. It's like we're hitting the ball hard. We're getting out. But also at the same time, it feels like every single time we need a hit or we get a guy on, we're either walking, which is typically good, but then the next guy grounds out into a double play. Like how many times have we seen a guy lead off walk or a lead off double, then a walk, and then a double play and the inning's over? I mean, dude, that that Degrom at bat today, that was so weird that he wasn't bunting. Yeah, I couldn't believe it, but that I think- was shocking. I th- uh, Keith was talking about it and during the game, and he's like, you got to bun. And even Alex asked me, he was like, why are they swinging here? And I go, I think because it's no just idea. been so bad that they're like, why not? Who cares? Yeah, I guess, but I think that's the wrong call. But I, I had a weird revelation about Chili Davis today. Not that I think he should be fired. I don't really love Chili Davis. He has been, not so recently, he may have changed his philosophy since, but he has shied away from analytics-based hitting, which... Analytics is much more of a pitching thing than a batting thing, but nevertheless, he seems to be more of an old school guy, which I get that a voice like that probably kind of helps sometimes, especially should in times like this. But it's weird that in 2019, the Mets' best two hitters, in my estimation, were J.D. Davis and Pete Alonso. And then and the Mets' offense as a whole was a little bit disappointing. Last season, the Mets had one of the better offenses in the league, and those two guys stunk. And that was without Chili Davis. And this year, again, the Mets' offense as a whole is horrific. And those two guys are the ones who have been statistically the best hitter so far. Isn't that weird? It is It is a weird thing to pick at because it, specifically Pete and JD have spoken, out, been outspoken about yes, how much no, they love Chili Davis. Those, those are his two greatest proponents by far. I don't think many other guys in this team I've heard at least speak only. I mean, no, not many people who should talk about a hitting coach. It's a hitting, it's a hitting coach, whatever. Chili Davis, he's a locker room guy. But it's just that was a weird trend, and not that that means anything. It's just strange. No, just something to think about. I mean, we there's again we we are trying to find the answer because it seems like literally no one has an answer. Seriously, feels like nobody knows what's going on except for the fact that there's uh, two glaring things that the Mets are not doing well. 
runners in scoring position, hitting with runners in scoring position. But like you said, at some point, that kind of comes down to luck It has sometimes. to, yeah. It, running in scoring position is such a luck stat because, first of all, it's a stat that takes into account batting average, which is a pretty lucky stat to begin with. And second of all, it's batting average when there's guys standing on certain bases. Besides, like, the pitcher's demeanor, mentality, possibly pitch selection, there's nothing that affects the batted ball with a man on base, maybe the defensive alignment. It's just they're just not finding it. Like, it's, just, it's just not happening. It's a bullshit It's a bullshit stat, and the Mets suck at it. Mets stink at it, and they, I mean, I'd, I'd just love to see, like, a ball hit the gap. When's the last time a ball hit the gap, it feels like? Oh, my God. When the, when the, when Christian Vasquez, that double tail, I was like, that looks amazing. I, wouldn't it be fun to hit the wall? <laughs> That's crazy. It'd be fun to, to bounce on the warning <laughs> some, track. Some guys running, running around yeah. the bases. And then, I guess, it doesn't help either that it seems like a guy hits, the next guy is, the next two guys are cold. A guy hits, the next two guys are cold. We talked about this in the last episode a little bit. At some point, do the Mets just change to a lineup of we're going one through nine, whoever is the hottest hitters right now. Because I mean, like I, I hate to say it, but Lindor is killing us. He's killing Awful. us right he now. Yeah. He, he's killing he's, us at the plate. Dude, he looks so stressed out. He seems something's, I don't know. Nothing's wrong physically, but something seems a little bit wrong. Did you mentally. see his press conference before the game today? Oh, about the booze? Well, about the booze. And uh, that's fine. He can say like, I don't, yeah. I don't like booze either. I didn't take anything into that, but like, it was interesting to me where he said he's not worried, which that's good, but also at the same time, like he doesn't feel like he's in a slump, which is just incorrect. I'm yeah, sorry, he, Francisco, he's, I love he's you. In, in a slump. And I'm, I'm going to have your back for the 11 years that you're here. But on this one time, when you say you're not in a slump, I get trying to have a positive mind and attitude, but like he even said, like, I'm not frustrated. It's like, dude, we've seen you slam the bat at the plate. We've seen you. You're, you're still a happy guy. Like he was talking crap to Christian Vasquez at second base today. But there's clearly some pressure on his back right now at the plate, and it's showing. He he knows what's wrong. No, definitely, yeah. But I do see what he's saying to a degree about not being in a slump, just because, like we said before, he's not striking out. Lindor has one of the lowest K rates in baseball. He's not swinging and missing anything. He's not really swinging balls out of strike zone. He's just doing this stupid thing over and over again where he just like flicks his bat at a pitch outside and just takes a lazy pop up. He's only has he only has one barrel this whole season. It's like ha- why? How is that even possible? It's like uh, Keith said uh, today. Is like what do you call it? His badunka dunk or whatever. He <laughs> called it know. some crazy word for his butt, but his butt was going out every single time. Oh my god! That he was there's a pitch on the outside corner, and they were talking about him flying open, which he has definitely missed flying open. That's a telltale sign you're not able to hit an outside pitch. Is that you lose that shoulder, and you're just putting the bat out there. It sucks, and it just it's it really sucks. And then like Dom has looked. I mean just. Dom is yeah. looked back I, to 2018, looks 17 Dom. Awful. They dropped a stat today that his batting average against breaking balls Can't is hit like under 100. Can't hit him. What the fuck is that? But then, I, I, the crazy I, thing, too, is I put it in the notes. The Mets are seeing the most fastballs out of any team in Major League Baseball. So it seems like teams have just figured out the Mets hitters right now, and we just simply haven't made an adjustment as well. Because, like, okay, the Mets are seeing 55.4% fastballs in pitches that they see, which, by the way, is insanely high. That's that is the, insane. That, that's, that could be skewed a little bit just the fact that the Mets played in cores. Cores sees a little bit more fastballs than other people. Other teams have played in cores, so it doesn't affect all of it. But I, but I think know. it even goes back to the point of just, like, it seems like teams are, like, being smart against the Mets, which that's what they should do. You, you should be playing the matchups. And it's just, it feels like we're behind every team preparation wise. Like, cause it just seems like we're not ready. We got punched in the face by the Red Sox and they didn't even score runs. I wouldn't say we got, I wouldn't say we got punched in the face. I would say we like, we like got shot with like a tranquilizer gun. And, and we just, like, we had to lay down motionless for two days. Like, we Actually, just couldn't you know, get up. You're right. If you punch the face is worse. I would say, like, you shot us in the knee and we just kind of crippled along. Yeah, like, just tried to, like... like it, it was like, I don't know, like every single like funny, stupid movie or that's episode of Sunny when they're at the ski ski resort and we just, we broke our legs like 10 yards from the finish line and we had to just like grab and try and claw our way there, but couldn't do it because who the, who the fuck can do that? Ben, there's a lot of great Sunny episodes like that. Charlie too with the Super Bowl where he's got yeah. his leg in the bear trap. <laughs> yeah, that Unrelated that. to what we're talking about, but. Oh, uh, I might, I might meme that tomorrow for the Mets up. Yeah. Just, the sun, just Charlie in a bear trap. Yes, that is. Because that's what it feels like with the Mets. Like, we get close, and then we go right back. And the one thing at least that we can talk about that's been great all year is the pitching. But we'll get going into that because let's just hop into game one now. We've yeah, 
turn it on. Let's hop in. The, let's hop into game one now. Fifteen minutes in. Yeah, let's we, hop into game one. Into the hop, full just hop in. Of everything hop that's in. going wrong. <laughs> yeah. Let's just hop in. David Peterson was good though. Game one. Yeah. David Peterson was good. This, this is again. This is David Peterson experience. Like sometimes he's going to throw a bunch of sinkers and the ground ball is going to find our gloves. Sometimes he's going to throw a bunch of sinkers and they're not going to find our gloves. Like he did well. He got through. He looked good. But it's just there's no swing and misses right now. Less than twenty percent whiffs. He's done that a few times this year. He threw 53 sinkers yesterday, and he didn't throw any pitch even 20 times, which is crazy. The Red Sox swung at 47 David Peterson pitches yesterday and had 21 foul balls. What's that even happen? What the fuck is that? <laughs> I think they also had a lot of foul balls today, too, the Red Sox against the Grom. It was such, I feel like this is the best way to describe game one is that Rafael Devers hit a doink. And that scored the winning run. J.D. Davis hit a ball too hard, and Michael Conscordo, Michael Michael Conscordo, yeah, I wish he was Conscordo. <laughs> Michael Conforto couldn't score because J.D. Davis literally hit the ball way too hard. You just had a slam poetry moment. You fucking ruined it. <laughs> my, 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 you were like getting your fucking monologue. Michael Conscordo, though, <laughs> botched it. <laughs> botched it. Botched it hard. Just like the Mets botched this series. Botched it. Fucking it's a botched bo- it. It's a botchery right now. Oh, oh, my God. You had a great tweet last night about McNeil's swing. And Keith Keith referenced basically the exact same thing you spoke about in the broadcast today. That was pretty cool. Yes, and we also have a little insight here coming in from Jeff McNeil himself because Jeff McNeil follows me on Twitter. No big deal. We're friends. It's okay. But last night, or I guess a couple nights ago, game one, uh, Jeff McNeil, I noticed, especially because he hit the home run in his first at-bat, I went... Something looks different with McNeil's stance. I was like, he looked a little more squatty. He was leaning a lot more on his back leg. He was a little more open. And he just looked a little little bit different at the plate. So I put, you know, on Twitter, side to sides of earlier in the season and then what he did in that home run. And you can tell there's an obvious difference. And this is how you know I was right, is because after the game, I mean, at 1026, I don't know when the game ended, 945. So 30 minutes (laughs) after the game was over, McNeil sends me the tweet and says, you're the only one who notices this, dot, dot, dot. Thank you. So I was like, that's great. And then tonight you saw SNY put it up on the score on, on the game. No credit to Giraffe Neck Mark. I'm sure if it was, you know, they would have been drooling all over him. But, you know, a fellow Mets fan can't ne- mention any names there. I'm, I'm salty about that one. That's, not even, worth, that's not even worth the mention. You should bleep that out. I'll, I'll do a, uh, <laughs> I'll put like a black bar over my yeah. face. But yeah, I mean, like McNeil. Oh, this is like a little insight to the conversation I had with him. Go figure. I had a conversation with an all-star second baseman who at 330 about hitting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Keep talking about it. He goes, he like basically that he's noticed that he's been having a problem with, he's a little too closed off. And this is something that he knows happens throughout, you know, seasons for him. Pat Mazika fixing him again. It's something that he's trying to fix. The no stride is a big thing for him as well because it keeps him a little more open. He doesn't get in front of his own body. Can't hit the inside pitch, which you've probably noticed this year. He hasn't been pulling the ball down the line, like on the or first base side, which he did so much when he was successful was hit those balls down the right field line for doubles. But then like tonight, he had some bad at bats. It's going to happen. The Mets as a whole just aren't doing great. But game one, at least he had a home run, and I was right. So I love being right. And then we got to have you be right, too, because Miguel Castro continues to be just sick. Miguel Castro is fucking amazing, dude. That His his inning yesterday was dope. He threw each of his three pitches four times each. That's so cool. He's sick. And Gary loves him. I love how much Gary loves him now. Gary is like, Miguel Castro is sick. He's embraced Miguel Castro, and he's embraced Blaster Jacks with Timmy Trumpets. He loves yeah. saying that on He the loves podcast. saying Blaster Jacks. He says Blaster Jacks all the time. He dropped it He dropped it during the inning today when it has nothing to do with anything. He was like, that pitch was Blaster Jacks. <laughs> like, what the he, fuck? <laughs> That's such an old guy move. <laughs> it's like the forbidden fruit for him a little bit. He's like, ooh, he's, I, I, he's so professional, and he gets to say Blaster Jackson, he loves he's gonna it. he's gonna say something's on fleek next week oh i'm excited for that because that's about the only thing to be excited for in mets baseball world right now it's funny listening to the vibes between keith and gary because keith is already getting kind of restless and there was a pavetta pitch today i want to say it was the dom or lindor i don't remember someone hitting lefty pavetta just floated a slider in the top of the zone 87 miles an hour high in i was like oh my god you gotta just spin your wrist on that ball and dumb. and it was dom yeah and gary was like Nice slider from Pavetta. And Keith goes, boy, that was a helicopter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this guy's not holding back. He's, he's a little pissed, just like us. He's had enough. And I know the players have definitely had enough. They don't want to play like this. We keep saying this. They're trying. But my God, can we Keith be did reference that today because they were talking a little bit about DeGrom's demeanor. And I guess this will be our this will be our transition right into game two. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, because game one stunk. So let's stunk. Move on to the other yeah. stinker. Well, this one did too. It doesn't yeah. matter. Tied for last. Um, but 
he mentioned that they were talking about how DeGrom never throws anyone under the bus. He always takes accountability. Like today, in the press conference, took accountability for the one run he gave up. He said he wished he could have been better. He said he didn't execute in the second inning. He gave up, like, I think, what, three hits? He had nine, nine strikeouts. Nine strikeouts. But Keith said, and I'll take his word on this because he – was a hitter. He was part of a lineup, a couple of very successful lineups, a couple of not very successful lineups. He said no one is more aware of their struggles than the lineup right now. And I believe him. These guys are playing like they're stressed out. There's no there's no loosey goosey in this team right now. This feels like the fourth or fifth straight episode that we've said that where the Mets are tight. Like yeah, at some tight. point they are when tight. are they just gonna loosen up? You can loosen up and play bad baseball, it happens. But like being so tight and playing bad baseball it's 20 games in the season, guys. You can't be tight 20 in because what's going to happen when we're at game 60? What's going to happen when we're at game 100? I, don't even know. I, can't, I can't even fathom that we have 142 more games. 100, yeah, 100, no, 143 more games of this. This has been the longest, most strenuous season that I can remember as a Mets fan. And it has to deal with the expectations as well. We expect big things from this team. But they've made these games so painful to watch. Yeah, this is, I gave the football analogy, I think, three or four episodes ago. This is like we're two games into an NFL season right now. The 16-game season. Fuck the 17-game schedule because that math is really hard. But <laughs> we're like an eighth of the way through. That's that's nothing in in terms of what's happening. But, like, this sucks. It's, 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 it's that. It is what it is. It's a deep sigh because, like, you at the end of the day, you know it's 20 games. It's not that big of a deal. But also, it is so hard not to think it's a big deal because how much... It's like the... Uh, I don't know where I'm going with this one, but basically, like, you let something... It's like when you let a team hang around a little bit and then they eventually get there. I feel like the team hanging around here is bad baseball and is it just going to be bad baseball all year long. I can't help but take that out of the back of my head. I actually kind of like the analogy. People let the Mets hang around. People let the Mets sit around 500 and they can't score a run. I want to talk about the ground for two minutes just because I owe it to him. He's we so good. He he's, deserves he's, it. He's so good. I'm not going to give all the stats because there's a million stats that come through every single day. I, for a second today... I didn't have the nuts. I almost bet the Mets under just because DeGrom was pitching. It was under 4.5 runs. I did, yeah. We texted, texted about it, it. And we said it was a lock. Yeah. Which, that was a guarantee. Yeah. I, did, I just didn't have the nuts because I didn't want to bet the Mets to lose, but I should have. One guy I follow on Twitter, he was like, Nick Pavetta start tonight. Like, he's playing against the Mets. DeGrom's pitching. They can't score. What a great call. Damn it. But DeGrom, he had, he, today, he, did, he didn't have it, which is crazy to say because his not having it is better than like 80% of the league's peak. It's ridiculous. That first inning, I had visions of thinking about DeGrom. It's kind of like the Mets have a closer for every inning he's in the game. Like his like per pitch statistics, like it lines up with guys like Hayter, Hendricks. Like that's what he looks like out there. He threw nine fastballs over 100 miles an hour today in six innings. That's foul. That's despicable. Like, it shouldn't be allowed. He he mixed up all three of his pitches much more than last week because he just didn't really have the command on the fastball. He showed his shoulder was flying open. And he kind of, I can't tell. I don't know anything about pitching mechanics, but he mentioned it after the game and he was demonstrating in the dugout. So he saw more changeups, saw more slide. There's still no curves. A couple games in a row, no curves. But again, like, whoop de fucking do. He, this happens. This is, just, this is just a weekly thing now. The stick to ROM dominates. Mets can't score. Lather, rinse, repeat. It's not fun. We stink. Can't hit. Didn't have good at bats. Didn't no. hit the ball hard, as I mentioned before. Today's game was awful. And I know you've been on, like, Pavetta and Richards are better pitchers than I necessarily believe or people believe and have been let on. They have good stuff, but we also made them look like they were much better pitchers than they are. Definitely. The Red Sox have sprinkled their fairy dust on both of them, and it's clear that they have gotten something positive out of each of them. I think Pavetta more so than Richards, even though P Richards was better this game. Pavetta's been better on the season. You know who else was gro gross? Your boy. My boy Whitlock. I told everyone to watch out for Gary Whitlock. Wow, did he look good. Rule 5 pick from the Yankees. That changeup is crazy. The fastball's electric. He'll be in that rotation pretty soon. And he looks like a fucking piece. It's a real shame the Yankees let him go. Uh, I hate to see it. I hate That's to see sad. it. At least yeah, he's really on the sucks. Red Sox. Dude, also Barnes. When did Matt Barnes get really good? Was well, he always just good? Matt Barnes did it a couple years ago. He just he has the whole issue of his control. If he If he is slightly off, he will walk everyone. He will walk everyone. But when that dude is clicking, he is one of the, I'm going to say it, nastiest closers in the game because that curveball is sick. I'll give him that. I'll give him nastiest curveball, but there's no way he's near the nastiest closers. You, you know some, some of the freaks that exist out there, the things they do? You ever seen Bruce Dark grather all throw a pitch? He's not even a okay, closer. Okay, fine. <laughs> like there's there's people who are better than Matt Barnes. All right, but Matt Barnes puts up the numbers. He's good. Though. He's Matt fine. Barnes. What are the numbers? He had like an 18 K per nine a couple years ago or some crazy 18 shit. 18 K per nine in the bullpen is like where you should be if you want to be elite. Like that's fine. Cool. Whatever. I We're talking about the Red Sox ball, but let's talk about the Mets bullpen because god damn, they've been unheralded so far because there haven't been enough leads to protect. But I want to just give like a general ode to our big three, Trevor May, Edwin Diaz, Miguel Castro. 
bowing. <laughs> we're bowing to them. Thank you for. <laughs> no, you were giving a being, bow. Thank you for uh, not being the worst. I didn't realize you were podcasting from Japan this evening. Yes. But <laughs> Castro this year, he's striking up forty-two percent of the batters he play he's uh, faced. That's elite stuff. May thirty-seven, Diaz twenty-eight. K minus walk, Castro 36.4, May 29.6. Like, it's unbelievable. <laughs> Miguel Castro's FIP is 0.33. That's so low. That's insane. Like, even the balls that are being put in play, he's getting unlucky on. Like, they're not hitting the ball hard or in good spots. And May's is 0.87. Like, those are n- nutty numbers. Nutty numbers. Not one. I'm knocking on every single thing I have. Those three guys have given up zero home runs this season combined, which home runs are down league wide, but. That's incredible for a bullpen not to be giving up home runs, especially three guys who are flamethrowers. It's great. I just wish, I just wish, I wish they were, I wish they had something to protect. And, you know, I'm going to include my guy Jerry's Familia in this as well. Have you seen his baseball savant numbers? No, it's incredible. Familia was good. I actually had him on this list beforehand, but I just want to talk about the big three because these, these guys are a three headed monster. Yes, of course. Familia's Familia leads the B team. He's the best player in the B team, which is a strong B team. You need, you need that. Yes, you need, you need the guy who can come in in the seventh when you're up four, you know? It's, it's all right. We're good. But the bats are about as bad as it is. And I think I just want to briefly talk about it because we said mentioned it a little bit earlier. Maybe we don't think the bat, maybe some of the guys aren't as good as we once thought. I'm not necessarily, I like, I think that's a thought in my head, but I know also at the same time, like that's crazy to say after 20 games, after watching these guys for hundreds of games and seeing what they can do. But the thing I think that's sticking out to me right now is You've been a big guy talking about like the ball being dead and you you talk to not necessarily on this podcast but in conversations that we've had talking about the dead in baseball and how some of the numbers have been, you know, artificially bumped up. Could the Mets be a little bit of a victim of that with some of their guys? Yeah, definitely. As a team that was near the top of the league in home runs last year, taking some more home runs out of the game will hurt the Mets. Like it's just bound to happen and I don't know. It's like I don't think it's really even conclusive what's happened to the ball yet, but basically the ball's being hit harder but not farther, which is a really crazy thing, which basically means that MLB is just paying attention to Twitter for the first time ever and affecting the ball in a way that will make more tweets happen, which is so ironic given the way they market the game. But it just seems like I don't want to blame the ball. I hate blaming the ball because no, that's kind of cheap. I'm not that blaming the ball. Everyone's, pl- everyone's playing with the same ball. But I guess when you take more home runs out of the game, the original estimation this season was you take five feet off every ball in the air. And I don't know if that was proven true, false, or indifferent yet, but the Mets are just not putting the ball out of the ballpark. It's not happening. So I've looked at some stat cast stuff of some other players and – like there was a Yerman Mercedes ball that was hit earlier, and I know that has nothing to do with the Mets, but just for baseball and all that kind of stuff, there was about 10 similarly hit balls over the last few years as this one in Seattle. And on average, the ball was traveling about 10 feet less. So there's definitely like a little more drag. I think that's the terminology that they're using. And for this Mets team, I mean, how many times have we seen like a hard hit ball and it just seemingly goes right to where the outfielder's playing right before the warning track? And it's like, oh man, like... We're not getting lift on the ball at all, and it feels like when we are getting lift on the ball, it's going foul and being caught, which we've seen a lot of as well recently. So yeah, I, we, the Mets have put some pretty great foul balls out there the last few days. Fantastic! They've been lacing balls. some foul balls, crushing them. The Mets have the least home runs in baseball, which is shocking. On a per at bat basis, they're not last, but they're close to last. They're sitting right around the Pirates, which is not a place that you want that you want to be. The Mets also right. If you're now, watching this on YouTube, I would love for you to don't cheat. Name. Four hitters on the Pirates that have hit a home yeah. run this year. Name Put in the four. comments. Put, in, Put the comments. in the comments. If you do it, I'll drop it a heart. I'll be checking it out. I mean, look at what it did to my hair that we were in the same conversation <laughs> as the Pirates. My hair is everywhere. The Mets also are have the seventh fewest home run per fly balls in baseball, which that's usually a stat that kind of is determined a little bit by luck. So chat should come back to average at some point. More fly balls will find the stands. But again, the only team's worse than the Mets in fly balls per home run, which Padres, which is surprising. Orioles, not surprising. Rays, not surprising. Not hitting. Royals, a little surprising, but they're more contact than Marlins, Pirates. Those are pretty horrible offensive teams that you've all mentioned. Yep. Which, all right, I'm done. I'm done talking about the Red Sox series. Let's preview this Philly series yeah, real quick Yeah, a few minutes. Here. Wow. The Phillies have the potential this weekend to literally rip the Mets' hearts out. This, you want to talk about punch in the face? We could get punched in the face these three games because tomorrow we're coming up against our boy, representative of two of the Mets' nine wins this season, Mr. Chase Anderson. We're coming for that ass, baby. If, if there's we, anybody to get hot against. If we don't hit Chase Anderson, so help me God, I am I am running to, into a brick wall. I am, I don't, I'm jumping through a window. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm putting put my head in the toilet. I'm going to be so upset if they can't hit Chase Anderson. I'll, I'll, most hope will be lost. 
I'm at the point where I'd, I'd love to see the Mets come out against Chase Anderson and literally, I, I don't just swing out of your shoes. I've said this a couple times now. Swing I don't, out of your I, shoes. I disagree with that. Don't do that. I'm stick, for it. Stick with your process. Hit, take swing some pictures. Swing out of your shoes. Try Salivate. and do some stuff. This guy puts it on a tee yeah. for you. But He's freaking Chase Anderson. This doomsday scenario, if we can't hit the beleaguer, the, the horrible Chase Anderson who stinks, we're going to hit him. We're going to win. We're going to get our third win on Chase Anderson on the year. <laughs> Vindicating us. <laughs> yes. We, he's going to be followed by Wheeler and Eflin. Wheeler looks so damn good. What a call by me. Same with Eflin. Another great call by James. Oh, but fuck. I don't know how we're going to hit those two guys. Yeah. I mean, the one saving grace is that no Segura, no, no. Harper. No, oh, Harper. That, that was kind of scary, scary tonight. Super yeah. scary. I don't like seeing anyone get hurt first off. You know, like even if you're a Philly or whatever team you're from. He got hit in the face. That shit is scary. That was horrifying. Hope I hope he's okay. He lo- he seemed okay. He seemed the most okay I've ever seen anybody get hit in the face ever. Yeah, somehow. Yeah, which is cool. But the Phillies were also being like kind of weird and combative that someone did that on purpose. No one hits anyone in the face on purpose. We're not Animal. Like that's crazy. Genesis Cabrera. <laughs> animal. <laughs> we're not, an accent we're not animal. animal. <laughs> no, that's that's a line from Goodfellas. We're not Animal. Nevertheless. No Segura. Hope they have Nick Matone playing. He's not very good. <laughs> Our, <laughs> he's just not. I thought Nick, you were going to tell me something rel- <laughs> no. revelatory about Nick I, Mayton. I tried to. It's Mayton, not Matone. I don't know. Who cares? <laughs> the guy, Phil, it's Phil Matone on the uh, on Cleveland. I, I don't know. I don't. I have no idea. Same last name. <laughs> I'm going to call him Mayton. He's Mayton yeah. to me. <laughs> I tried to find something interesting because he's actually had a nice cup of coffee this year. He's a top 20 prospect in the system. His batting average in balls and plays over 600. Fuck that All guy. Right, so he's hot. He's, he's lucky, hot. lucky son of a bitch. You play the lottery. <laughs> Give me some of that. Our old friend oduball has been back in the lineup on a daily Piece basis. Of shit, garbage, Fuck, Fuck. fucking asshole, disgusting yeah. human being, despicable. Shouldn't even be in the league. Whatever. And I know for a fact, a scientific fact, I will put everything on it. I'll put, I'll put my firstborn on it. I'll put my right thumb on it. Brad Miller is going to get a big hit this series, and I am going. I'm going to rip. I'm going to rip my couch in half. Real quick, where's our boy Guillaume? I have no idea. Why? Yeah. Why hasn't he been playing? Why, why has he been banished to the realm of not playing? Because he's actually hitting. He is actually hitting. God. Since again, since that game in against the Nationals, he has an OPS almost at nine hundred. <laughs> Get like, this guy at bats. It's like eight at bats, whatever. But I would like to see Guillaume again. But he should be playing. He should be playing Friday with Marcus Stroman. He should be paired with Marcus Stroman forever and always. He should play all three games this series. We have our three sinker ballers on the hill between Stroman, Walker, and Peterson. They've all been throwing the sinker a lot. There's going to be some ground balls. Fuck the Phillies. Put Guillaume on the field, please. Please put Guillaume on the field. Yeah. Oh God, it's just I don't like. I'm so not looking forward to this Phillies series because, like you said, it's well, my stomach relax. Um, it has my stomach's my stomach's upset too about watching this horrible hey. Mets performance. Oh, I hope the mic picks that up. Oh, if it does, it's staying in the the edit. So if you guys hear this, well, you can listen for my stomach. Go back, but yeah, Mark had fried chicken for dinner. Yeah, uh, we actually had sausage, but that's that's on another note. Sausage oh yeah, you peppers. just came back. You got the sausage yeah. and the of lemon potatoes. Gotta have sausage yeah. for my mom. <laughs> Cooks it well. But I made lemon. I tried lemon potatoes today for the first time. They came out okay. I love me some lemon potatoes. Yeah, you gotta, so good. You gotta get my grandma's recipe. I would. Lo- I would love nothing more. Uh, I'll, I'll get it to you. I'll get it to you. That's that's I, off the podcast. I Back to my that. my um soliloquy here. <laughs> Your upset stomach. <laughs> yeah, upset stomach. Soliloquy. And where the fuck I'm currently feeling with the New York Mets, and it's that. Oh man, this this series has the makings, especially for someone who loves to shit talk the Phillies, for really really bad it's days. Be a bad for weekend me. for you. It has a chance to be a bad weekend, but please, Mets, if you're if there's anybody listening to this on the Mets team, wake up, hit the baseball, beat the fucking Phillies. Just take two. I don't even want to sweep. Take two. Play good baseball. Hit. Let's, let's, hit. let's just win Friday and then and figure Saturday. out figure out the rest. Figure then out the rest. Sunday and just win them all. I'm tired of losing. How have we gone from a team that was in first place now to what tied for last? You said, yeah. <laughs> are we? I don't even know if we are. I don't, even, I don't think I said that, but we I feel are, like the last place team the way we're playing. No, we're not. We're still ahead of the Marlins and Nationals. Thank God, Nationals suck. That team. They actually played well tonight. They they obliterated their old friend Stephen Matz, <laughs> a familiar foe. Good. I'm tired of seeing him pitching so well. That's so <laughs> <Enough>. mean. <laughs> Enough. You did shit for us. Jumped, time jumped all Enough. over him. Enough. But yeah, the Braves look at the Braves annihilated Kyle Hendricks again. Something might be wrong with him. But just we just gotta beat the Phillies. Beat teams in your division. That's how you win it. Gotta beat the Phillies. Gotta beat the Phillies. It's Red Sox series. Fuck it. I don't care about the Red Sox. The Mets aren't gonna see the Red Sox for Red Sox for a couple more years. Good riddance. Good riddance. And I guess uh, real quick, the bad take of 
this episode will be my take from last episode, oh. which will be that uh, Garrett Richards is a part of the Chi Chi Gonzalez <laughs> yeah. Chase Anderson. That was play. a bad. T- I told you it was a bad take. You shouldn't have said that shit. You you that this is your fault partially. This is not all fault. the way. I'll, I'll take I'll take the hit on this one. I think I've made the most appearances on the bad Mets <laughs> it takes. It takes by the way. a big man to admit when they are wrong. You are that big man. So congratulations. Thank you. That's the only time anyone's ever called me a big man. <laughs> you're standing here at five foot nine, one fifty, soaking wet. Oh god. But uh, yeah, that's gonna wrap up our episode number 10 here of the Mets sub podcast. There's just, there's simply not a lot to talk about in a two game series where the Mets scored one run pitched. Well, they play better. That's what the, that's what the theme of this episode is. Mets need to play better, which I'm tired of this being the theme of the episode. Too many episodes of playing better. James, final remarks, final concerns, final concerns. We can't hit final remarks. I hope we do. Yeah. I think, I think we're all in the same boat and you know, Chase Anderson, better. baby. Slump Chase Buster. Anderson. Slump Chase Buster. Anderson is the saving grace. Slump Buster. Got to do it. I, I He better not. Oh, my God. I'm getting mad thinking about it because all I can do so, so. I'm not no. even putting it out there. That's it. Positive, We're hit him. positive, positive mental attitude. Good vibes positive. only. Po- good vibes only. Thank you guys so much for listening to episode number 10 of the Mess Up Podcast. You know where to find us. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and you can watch us on YouTube. Follow us on all our social media at Mets Up, and you can follow James at Jeter Had No Range, me, Mark Luino, Giraffe Neck, Mark. Thank you guys so much for listening to episode number 10 of the Mets Up Podcast, and we'll see you at the end of the Philly series next week, Sunday Night Baseball. Fuck that. We didn't even talk about that, but that's where we're going to end it because it's miserable. That's going to be uh, such a long, it's going to be such a late show. It's going to be late, but we'll be there. See you guys next episode. Bye.